Let's now return to the previous question, which is still unanswered. What caused the initial collapse of the upper section of the towers under the rest of the building? As we have seen, there was a bowing of the facade before the collapse, but the trusses didn't have any strength of their own to cause such a massive bending of the external structure. If explosives were used, however, and this part of the core structure was made to collapse first, then the trusses would have had enough strength to pull along the facade and to initiate the global collapse. In fact, it was observed that the antenna from the North Tower begins dropping slightly before the top section of the building collapses, which indicates the central structure was destroyed first. Even though a controlled demolition seems the only valid explanation for the collapses, the debunkers have brought different arguments against this possibility. The first argument is that it would have been impossible to place the explosives under everyone's eyes. It would take an army of workers, it would take months. So this idea that, you know, some crew dressed in black could sneak in the middle of the night and wire a building like that to be demolished is just, it's absurd. Ipotizziamo che siano veramente state minate. Come si fa? Entrano di nascosto delle persone? Portano dell'esplosivo? Scusi, sa, devo lasciare qui questa mai, questa serie di zainetti? Non ci faccia caso, poi spariscono. There are, however, different facts to be considered. The first one is that in the months previous to 9-11, a major renovation of the elevator system in both towers was undertaken. From the March 2001 issue of Elevator World, we read, Ace Elevator undertook what was perhaps one of the largest, most sophisticated elevator modernization programs in the industry's history at New York City's prestigious World Trade Center. No one is suggesting that this company had anything to do with the possible planting of explosives. But such an extensive renovation process would have certainly provided the cover for a special team to access the internal structure of the buildings at any given time. As explained by Richard Human, chief electrical engineer for the Twin Towers, the elevator shafts gave direct access to the core columns. I'm very familiar with the interior structure that surrounded the elevator shafts and, uh, of course, uh, their access to the elevator shafts gave them total access to the surrounding core columns, the interior of the core columns. Secondly, the movement of heavy equipment on floors that were supposedly empty was noticed in the weeks leading up to 9-11. Scott Forbes worked for a financial institution on the 97th floor of the South Tower. It must have been at least um, four to six weeks before 9-11. It, it was like rebuilding work going on upstairs. The tenants, the people from Aeon who had been there were moved somewhere else. The offices were just vacant. And there was a lot of heavy machinery building work going on. It was almost like pneumatic drills and lots of hammering. So much so that the floors were shaking. That's how noticeable it was. It was almost as if uh, something heavy was being moved and then it was being taken off wheels and it was like boom. Our floor underneath literally shook. You could feel the weight above you. William Rodriguez, an employee at the Twin Towers for more than 20 years, recalls a similar experience. As I stood there on the 33rd floor, I heard very strange noises on the 34th floor. I heard very heavy equipment being moved around, and it sounded like uh, dumpsters with uh, uh, metal wheels being moved around and I got scared because I knew it was an empty floor. Nobody was supposed to be there. As a matter of fact, not even the elevators stopped there. You have to have a special access key to open the door on the 34th floor. Thirdly, after the 1993 attack, bomb-sniffing dogs had been adopted in the security system of the Twin Towers. But on Thursday, September the 6th, bomb-sniffing dogs were abruptly removed, according to a security guard, with no apparent reason. And lastly, there was an unprecedented power down in the South Tower on the very weekend before 9-11. For the first time in 30 years, all the security systems in the building had become useless at the same time. People could come and go as they pleased, even in protected areas, without being seen nor recorded by surveillance cameras. The previous weekend, there had been a power down. Uh, because of the power down, there was a complete breakdown of security that weekend. We had guided tours coming into uh, secured areas by mistake and nobody picking it up because there's no intrusion alarms or, or anything else. Scott Forbes was also present during the power down. There was a power down in the South Tower on the weekend of the 8th and 9th of September. 
and it wouldn't have just have, been, uh, have affected uh, camera security, it would have affected um, all the secure systems on doors um, for either key locks or security badges and so on to undo them. They weren't working because they're all powered by electricity, so there was no power, there was no backup system, therefore they were all open. What again was the excuse that the Port Authority gave you, Scott, for this 36-hour period of, of the power being down in the uh, South Tower? Um, the explanation was that there was um, a recabling exercise uh, to increase the bandwidth of networks that were available in the towers. But what I can recall is that there were plenty of toolboxes, there were, there were plenty of spools of cable, there were men around wearing um, overalls, um, you know, they appeared to be like engineers. Um, at the time, it seemed perfectly legitimate what they were doing because this was the story we were given, that there was a recabling exercise. The debunkers are right. It would have been very difficult to bring in the explosives without being noticed. But with the proper cover story, it could have been done under everyone's eyes, in full daylight, without anybody even questioning what was going on. Another argument by the debunkers is that controlled demolitions, they say, always begin from the bottom, while the destruction of the Twin Towers clearly started from the top. Controlled demolitions always begin from the bottom of the building. You cut the bottom columns and then the building falls. If you look at the World Trade Centers, both of them began at the impact wounds where the planes hit. Il crollo da torre parte dall'alto, mentre le esplosioni controllate parte sempre dal basso. Si demoliscono le fondamenta, poi si va su e la torre, il palazzo che deve essere demolito, crolla subito. But this is not true. Every controlled demolition can be designed according to the needs. In fact, sometimes it's not a good idea to start from the bottom. <laughs> this brings us directly to the issue of explosions. In the same interview where he praised the solidity of the Twin Towers, John Skilling stated, I'm not saying that properly applied explosives, shaped explosives of that magnitude, could not do a tremendous amount of damage. I would imagine that if you took the top expert in that type of work and gave him the assignment of bringing these buildings down with explosives, I would bet that he could do it. On September 11, there were dozens and dozens of loud explosions reported by firefighters, policemen, journalists, and regular citizens, both before and during the collapse of both towers. For all these explosions, however, the debunkers have a blanket explanation. The witnesses were confused. They were not real explosions. It's interesting to note that all the testimonies that talk about explosions have heard them. No one has ever seen them. There are things that happened inside the building, pieces coming loose as a result of the extreme impact very well may have been interpreted as explosion. Molto spesso i profani parlano di explosion, ma non parlano, non intendono strettamente la carica di dinamite che fa boom. Parlano di botto, di boato, e il boato può essere dovuto a tante ragioni. What's an explosion sound like? Most people don't know because most people have never heard one. So any sharp, loud bang that's probably an explosion. The fact is, most of the explosions were reported by firefighters and policemen, and no one knows how to recognize an explosion in a burning building better than they do. As we were getting our gear on and making our way to the stairway, there was a uh, heavy-duty explosion. And everybody just started running for the door. Everybody was trapped. New York's bravest never had a chance. We really never even got to that close to the building. The explosion blew and it knocked everybody over. The whole time you're hearing boom, 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 boom. So. I think I know an explosion when I hear it. <laughs> in August 2005, the New York Times published 12,000 pages of oral histories rendered in the voices of 503 firefighters and emergency personnel who were present at the Trade Center on September 11. Over 100 of them, one-fifth of the total, has reported explosions in the buildings prior or during the collapses. Regular citizens also seem quite capable of telling an explosion from a simple object falling to the ground. Something, either they blew the lobby up or, or something, because it blew the glass out of the doors and knocked us all down, and I got a uh, smoke and everything on me. I just feel a little shook up because I got blasted, you know. So. Before proceeding, one thing should be known about controlled demolitions. 
Just like the Twin Towers, most modern buildings are built with a high redundancy factor in terms of structural strength. For this reason, a series of preliminary explosions is normally needed in controlled demolitions to weaken the structure before the actual collapse can be induced. Obviously, in the case of the Twin Towers, it would not have been possible to set off the preliminary explosions all at once, just before the collapse. To make them less noticeable, it would have been wise to set them off at separate intervals, any time between the impacts of the planes and the collapse of the towers. For this reason, it's important to keep in mind the exact chronology of the events. 846, first impact into the North Tower. 903, second impact into the South Tower. 959, collapse of the South Tower. 1028, collapse of the North Tower. 520 in the afternoon, collapse of Building 7. Witnesses normally call first explosion the one that came with the impact of the planes, while they call secondary explosions all those that took place in separate moments between the impacts of the planes and the collapse of the two towers. We got that second, that first secondary explosion really got us spooked because we were in the building. Then there's all secondary explosions and then the subsequent collapses. We've heard reports of secondary explosions after the aircraft impacted. According to several witnesses, there was a secondary explosion that took place in the basement of the North Tower just before the plane hit the building. At 8.30, he says he was headed to level B4 in Tower 1, four stories below ground. I go downstairs, the foreman tells me to go to remove the containers. As I'm walking by the main freight car of the building in the corridor, that's, that's when I got blown. I mean, the impact of the explosion of whatever happened it threw me to the floor. Morelli then remembers a second explosion, separate from the first. I was racing, I was going towards the bathroom, all of a sudden I opened the door, I didn't know it was a bathroom, and all of a sudden a big impact happened again and all the steel and tile was falling down, the light fixtures were falling. According to the 9-11 Commission, it was the jet fuel pouring down the elevator shafts that caused the explosion in the basement. From the final report we read, a jet fuel fireball erupted upon impact and shot down at least one bank of elevators. The fireball exploded onto numerous lower floors, including the B4 level, four stories below the ground. But the witnesses described an explosion that took place in the basement before the impact of the plane. Very strong, boom! An explosion so hard that pushed us upwards, upwards. And it came from the basement between the B2 level and the B3 level. And at that moment, I thought it was the mechanical room where they have all the pumps and the generators for the building that maybe a generator just blew up on the basement. Now, 20 years in the building, you know something that comes from the bottom and something that comes from the top. And when I went to verbalize that it was a generator, we hear, boom, all the way on the top, the impact of the plane on the top. Two different events, two different times. There are others who remember several explosions after the one from below. It came from, I believe, at first we believed that it came from the mechanical room. Then uh, we heard a series of other uh, explosions that sounded up on the above uh, levels of the of the building. I was in a, the B4 level, and on my way, I heard a, a bomb. So I says, uh, probably a transformer again blew up. So I stepped back, finished what I had to finish, and I started towards the door again. And there come a big blast with a big ball of fire. The two separate explosions were recorded at a distance of about nine seconds from each other during a business meeting that was taking place in a building nearby. One Liberty Plaza. Yeah. 
When faced with this precise question, the editors of Popular Mechanics chose not to answer it, and fell back on the generic explanation of the jet fuel in the elevator shafts. Ask uh, what your guys' explanation is for Willie Rodriguez's testimony that he heard, or that he heard, experienced, and his co-workers were actually burned by an explosion in the basement of the North Tower prior to the plane hitting, and this has been verified by at least 20 different eyewitnesses. Jim Max of Popular Mechanics. The uh, when the building struck, when the plane struck the buildings, they uh, they penetrated the internal core. Jet fuel poured down uh, stairwells and elevator shafts, setting off secondary explosions. Not to mention the horrific impact of these fully loaded planes hitting the structure and Mr. causing Mix. enormous swing. It's interesting for a second. to know too that the, the you, you, still, you still didn't, you still didn't address the, the fact that it was before Empire State Building crash back in 1945. But the explanation of the jet fuel in the elevator shafts has several problems of its own. First of all, there were no regular elevators connecting the basement to the top levels of the towers. Each tower consisted of three separate buildings built on top of one another, each with their own elevator system. There were only two elevators connecting the lobby to the 44th and 78th floor. But the plane struck on the 95th floor, which means the fuel could not have poured down these elevator shafts. There were only two banks of elevators that went all the way from the basement to the top of the towers, and they were mostly used by maintenance people. In one of these elevators was Arturo Griffith. Well, I was on my way from B2 to 49th floor. Not only didn't Griffith get cremated by this supposed ball of fire, but he also remembers three separate explosions. And there was a loud explosion and the elevator dropped. When the elevator finally stopped, they had an explosion that bring the doors inside the elevator. And then they had another explosion in the panel that threw me, you know, against the wall. Most importantly, the theory of the jet fuel in the elevator shafts fails to take into consideration the volumes involved. Each tower had an approximate volume of 2,160,000 cubic yards. The planes that hit the towers carried an estimated 10,000 gallons of fuel each at the time of impact. 10,000 gallons is the equivalent of 50 cubic yards. This in-scale graphic shows what 50 cubic yards look like next to the volume of the tower. Assuming that about half of the fuel was consumed in the initial explosion, we would be left with some 25 cubic yards of fuel available. But most of this fuel is needed to ignite the fires at different floors, as explained by Mr. Meggs himself. Jets crashed into buildings. They crashed at an angle, which meant that their wings, which is where they store most of their fuel, cut through multiple floors. So they splash fuel and debris across multiple floors of the building, igniting fires. So even assuming that, for some strange reason, five of those cubic yards were all to end up in the only elevator shaft that goes all the way to the bottom of the tower, there wouldn't be enough to reach the basement in significant quantities. Your typical 10 foot by 30 inch backyard pool contains roughly 1,000 gallons of water, which is the equivalent of five cubic yards. Imagine dumping the water from this pool into this kind of elevator shaft with a drop of more than 1,000 feet below, and you'll get the idea of how much fuel can actually reach the bottom. In any case, the fuel in the elevator shafts theory could never account for the powerful explosion that literally devastated the lobby of the North Tower one hour after the first impact and before the collapse of the South Tower. It was a secondary explosion, probably a device either planted before or on the aircraft that did not explode until an hour later. Then somebody said that they saw an airliner going to one of those towers. Then, uh, I don't know, an hour later than that, we had that big explosion from much, much I don't know what on earth caused that. In fact, these firemen reported three large explosions in Tower 1, which took place after the plane's impact. They also confirmed it was the third explosion to devastate the lobby of the tower. It was an explosion. It was in the lobby, and it fucking, this, the third explosion, the whole lobby collapsed on us. What you tell me is that there was a plane or whatever hit the building, then a secondary explosion. It was like three explosions after that. We came in after the, after the fire. We came when the fire was going on already. We was in the staging area inside the building, okay. waiting to go upstairs. Oh, I and they oh, oh, explosed. Oh, the, whole, oh, the whole lobby collapsed on the lobby inside. It took these witnesses about one hour to walk down from the 82nd floor to the lobby of the North Tower after the impact of the plane. We got to the fourth floor from 82nd floor. We stuck on the stairs for a while. We finally got down to the lobby. Then we get to the lobby, which is big. I don't know if it's just like what you just seen. That's what we went through before we came out of the building. 
Then when we get out the building, there's another smoke barricade. A similar story here, the long descent from Tower 1 and the big explosion in the lobby. It was like holy hell coming down them stairs. And then when we go, we got, finally got to the bottom, we were coming out, on a mezzanine level there, and another explosion came right from it, because everyone flying. Yet another similar story. Big boom, come down the steps, everything fine, till we got to the basement, and then everything just fell in. Uh, I got trapped on there with another guy, crawled out, kept getting hit in the head, kept bags all around, finally we clawed our way out over the rubble. The situation in the lobby was such that there was no doubt on what had happened. The ladies that are with me were in the World Trade Center on the on, in the first building and escaped through the lobby where they report they believe there was a bomb in the lobby. We ran down the steps to the lobby. There was no lobby. Everything was torn up. We came outside the lobby. There was no lobby. The lobby was totally gone. Did you see other people? People. There was a woman there with her face blown off. Big glass lobby and all the glass was broken. Wires hanging from the ceiling, the signs that would hang above telling you where to go were all hanging. It was, it was unbelievably scary to look at. Firefighter John Schroeder was climbing the stairs of Tower 1 when he heard the huge explosion from below. We were heading up to the 24th floor of the stairwell, and all of a sudden our building got rocked. We got bounced around in the stairwell like pinballs, man. And we just said, you know what, time to go. We came down, it, was, it looked like a bomb went off in the lobby. Everything was exploded, everything was gone. We're like, what is going on here? For the, every window in the lobby to be exploded, I mean, them windows were like as thick as forget it. There were two, three inch glasses, you know, come on. They exploded out of the lobby, you know, something, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't from the jet fuel, no way. Then we have the accounts from those who heard explosions moments before the South Tower collapsed. John McLaughlin was a police officer for the Port Authority. Going into Tower 1, we heard a loud explosion coming from the area of Building 2, and at that point, Building 2 was collapsing. We saw the top begin to blow out in a plume of smoke, and we heard the noise uh, associated with an implosion. I was about five blocks away when that, I heard uh, explosions, three thuds, and turn around to see the building we just got out of antenna tip over and fall in on itself and then all of a sudden three tremendous explosions and everything started coming down then there was a tight sequence of detonations during the collapse of the south tower which many described as firecrackers you heard a big explosion before I, the building fell i saw it as it was happening and it sounded as if you had a hundred of those little black cat firecrackers and you lit them all off at once that's what it sounded like it sounded like the finale of the fourth of july as the first tower came down, there were a series of explosions. It was like boom, boom. You could hear the echoes of the explosions echoing off the different buildings. The uh, detonation started, and they went boom, boom, boom. They were a little less than a second apart. Below the fire, I saw from the corner, boom, 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 boom. Just like 20 straight hits. Just yeah, because there were plans yeah. to take down a building. Boom, 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 boom. boom. All the way down. So it was like boom, 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 boom. From far away, boom, boom. And you heard the boom, 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 boom. The same kind of detonations were heard during the collapse of the North Tower. Second tower number one, the second tower collapsed. It was the exact, exact same series of detonations. And then it started to sound like firecrackers. The debunkers doubt that there were explosions, they say, because no explosions were recorded in the videos from the collapses. Le demolizioni fanno rumore, fanno dei botti estremamente precisi, fortissimi come li avete sentiti. Come mai nelle, nelle, nelle immagini delle torri gemelle non ci sono le esplosioni, ma c'è un solo boato continuo? Lorsqu'il y a une explosion, la ressemble. On la ressent comme il faut. Ça se, ça se, ça se mesure, ça se, on la registre. First of all, the debunkers forget that most of the television shots were taken from a distance with long telephoto lenses, and they don't carry the actual sound from the towers. While in the videos shot by amateurs, the soundtrack is usually covered by the screams of those standing around the camera. <laughs> In any case, it's not true that no explosions were recorded by video cameras. 
In this shot, for example, a series of loud concussions can be heard just before the collapse begins. On the left, covered by smoke, is the South Tower moments before the collapse. In this shot by ABC television, the initial explosion can also be heard. Listen carefully after the words FBI agents. This is as close as we can get to the base of the World Trade Center. You can see the firemen assembled here, the police officers, FBI agents. The explosion can be heard even better by separating the stereo track of the microphone from the one of the camera. The same explosion can be heard in the same clip used in a PBS documentary. But a key question remained. Did their ultimate failure... But a key question remained. Did their ultimate failure... And then there were several explosions recorded after both towers had collapsed, like this one from this BBC video. This one was recorded after both of the Twin Towers had collapsed and before Tower 7's collapse. Amateurs also kept recording explosions after the collapse of both towers. It's now 11 o'clock. Still here continuing explosions, but... It's another explosion. This recording was made between 10 and 11 o'clock. The explosion came from the direction of Building 7. In fact, a big explosion in Building 7 was reported before either tower had collapsed. Sometime after 9 o'clock, Barry Jennings was descending the stairs of Building 7, trying to reach street level. Well, me and Mr. Hesch, the Corporation Council, were on the 23rd floor. I told them we got to get, get out of here. We started walking down the stairs. We made it to the 8th floor. Big explosion. Blew us back into the 8th floor. Jennings was trapped in the building for several hours, together with his colleague, Michael Hess. Mr. Hess! Eighth floor, seven world trade. I passed the word. After they were rescued by the fire department, Mr. Hess confirmed the big explosion on the eighth floor. So, Mr. Hess, you were trapped in, I believe, seven world trade center. Go ahead, sir. Yes, I was. I was up in the emergency management center on the 23rd floor. Uh, another gentleman and I walked down to the eighth floor where there was an explosion. In a later interview, Jennings has confirmed the explosion took place before either tower had collapsed. Both buildings were still standing. I was trapped in there for several hours. I was trapped in there when, when both buildings came down. While he was trapped, Jennings kept hearing more explosions. All this time, I'm hearing all type of explosions. In fact, explosions near Building 7 were recorded up to a few minutes before the building collapsed. And finally, there is also someone who saw an explosion up close, through his very eyes. It's Ron DeFrancesco, the same person who had descended from the 91st floor of the South Tower all the way to the lobby. When he was exiting the building, he heard an explosion. He spun around, and a fireball was coming down the hallway at him. He put his arms up, blew him across Church Street. He woke up in the hospital two days later. Yeah, I had burns, they say, on 80% of my body, and um, I had broken bone in my back, and... Um, I guess my ears were turned inside out just with the burns. My head was very swollen. You know, my, I had my contacts in, so they were melted to my eyes. And uh, To doubt the content of all these accounts does not mean to have debunked the claims of explosions. It means to willfully ignore dozens and dozens of dramatic testimonies which describe a story of September 11 quite different from the one we have been told so far. Question. Given that after the initial explosion and the ensuing fires, there wouldn't have been enough jet fuel left to pour down the elevator shafts in substantial quantities, can you explain the at least three separate explosions reported by multiple witnesses at the time of the first impact in the North Tower? In particular, can you explain the huge explosion reported by multiple witnesses in the basement of the North Tower moments before the impact of the plane? 
Can you explain what caused the huge explosion that literally devastated the lobby of the North Tower, according to multiple witnesses, about one hour after the impact of the plane and before the collapse of Tower 2? Can you explain what caused the big explosion reported by Mr. Jennings and Mr. Hess on the eighth floor of Building 7 before either tower had collapsed? Can you explain what caused the multiple explosions recorded by different camera crews, including the BBC and CNN, after the towers had collapsed and before the collapse of Building 7? Can you explain how more than 100 witnesses, most of them firefighters and policemen, could have all been mistaken in reporting explosions at the Twin Towers on September 11? Another element suggesting controlled demolitions are the so-called squibs, the puffs of debris that were noticed on the sides of both towers as the collapses took place. Squibs occur in controlled demolitions when concrete is forcefully expelled from the building by the explosions occurring inside. The individual explosions that I noticed 20 and 30 and 40 stories below the collapsing structure, those are what we demolitions guys call squibs. And that's another characteristic that seems to be evident. But for the squibs in the Twin Towers, the debunkers have a different explanation. A building like that, it's like a giant accordion. It's full of air. When the top of that building comes down, all that air has to come out. And where it comes out, it comes out the windows. It blows out the windows. Quanto agli sbuffi, se pensiamo a questi piani che si schiacciano uno sull'altro, l'aria che esce, che porta polvere, fumo e detriti fuori, li spiega abbastanza bene. The debunkers forget that several squibs were observed 20, 30, or 40 floors below the level of the collapse, in an area where the floors above were still perfectly intact. There is no smoke or concrete to be pushed out here when the collapse has only reached this level at this point. But even in this case, the debunkers have an explanation. Et ça, ça s'explique justement par la communication des surpressions, par les cages d'ascenseur. Or là, c'est les cages d'ascenseur. Il y a bien sûr aussi des escaliers. Donc ça aussi, euh, et ça a permis donc euh, cette, euh, cette évacuation de l'air, non seulement sur les côtés, mais aussi euh, dans toute la tour, en mettant en pression le bâtiment. But elevators and stairs have doors at almost every floor. Had there been such a strong compression from above, it would have pushed with equal force on all the floors below, not just the one where the squib occurred. In any case, this is clearly not broken glass. Glass fragments from a window would not even be visible from such a distance. These are high-speed ejections of concrete and other solid debris, which can only be explained by a powerful explosion having occurred nearby. There is even one case in which the expulsion of material, and possibly a human being, takes place before the collapse has begun. Question. Given that what we see is clearly not glass from a broken window, but concrete and other debris, can you explain what caused the squibs observed 30 or 40 floors below the level of collapse? Technically speaking, squibs are just a particular case of explosions occurring below the level of collapse. But powerful ejections of concrete and other material have been observed throughout the entire collapse of both towers.
The result of such explosive force is the lateral ejection of large chunks of the external structure all around the towers. The spread of debris in a large radius around each tower, what we see is an outward explosion of material beyond the perimeters of each footprint. FEMA has documented a 1,200-foot diameter debris area around each tower where major chunks of the buildings were found. This means that parts of the structure were ejected laterally at a distance twice as large as the width of the tower itself. Large, multi-ton beams were hurled hundreds of yards laterally. Gravity works vertically, not laterally. The debunkers contend that the material ejected laterally was only the aluminum foil covering the structure, not the steel beams themselves. These elements that are there, certain people, you realize, of the debris that make several tons. No, that's not the debris that make several tons. It's just the parement that was intended to be on the towers, which was the plaques of aluminum that were placed on the poutres in acier. The poutres in acier are there and there. That's just the des choses très légères qui ont volé, tout, comme tout à l'heure, ma touillette à café. Voilà. Voilà. Kirant is mistaken. The chunks of material being hurtled hundreds of feet away are not just aluminum covering. They are the same prefabricated blocks of steel structure used to build the two towers. In this case, a person who has remained attached to a block of columns falling can give us an idea of the structural pieces being detached from the building. Several large chunks of structure ended up embedded in buildings nearby. David Chandler of Architects and Engineers has calculated the energy needed to hurdle some of these chunks of structure to such a distance from the buildings. Using special software, we can analyze motion on video clips frame by frame. I have placed markers on each frame so we can track a particular projectile. From the markers, we can get a data table and plot various graphs. The data here shows that the object we are tracking was shot horizontally at over 70 miles per hour. The energy needed to hurl a four-ton girder at this speed is comparable to the energy needed to hurl a 200-pound cannonball three miles. <laughs> Question. Given that the falling upper sections of the towers had no additional energy to destroy the healthy structure below, where did the energy to hurdle these large chunks of structure at such a distance from the towers come from? Once the smoke had settled and the recovery work commenced, more evidence pointing at controlled demolitions started to emerge. One example are the supporting columns cut at a 45 degree angle that were noticed sticking out of the ground. This kind of cut is typical of controlled demolitions and is obtained by placing linear charges on the columns at a 45 degree angle. Now this is a linear shape charge and it's wired in with the, with the dynamite. When it cuts, uh, it'll cut this column right on this angle and then this piece will be deflected and dis displaced uh, in that direction. Some of those cuts on the larger chunks of the structure, called candlesticks, were made by iron workers during the removal operations. But cut columns were noticed on the very evening of September 11, far before the removal operations had started. You know, this is the first day in a pile. You know, actually, it was on the 11th. It was 8 o'clock at night, and there's we had a hunt for iron workers. But meanwhile, there was tons and tons of beams that were cut with no acetylene to be had, nor iron workers to do the work. It's just physically not possible to cut that much steel in that amount of time, especially with no one to operate the equipment. It just didn't add up. When asked about the presence of columns cut at a 45 degree angle, Danilo Coppe, Italy's foremost expert in controlled demolitions, stated, I'll confess, this is extremely curious from a technical point of view, as this is a very similar result to the one obtained with cutting charges. Another kind of cut commonly used in controlled demolitions is the so-called V-cut. This little V here gives it a place to slide off. That's all it does. And by, by putting them on at this diagonal, we're trying to fill this structure in this direction. A large V-cut is visible on this chunk of structure from Building 7. The same chunk exhibits also a 45-degree angle diagonal cut on the crossbeam, with a lighter V-cut at the end of the other beam. 
can you suggest a good reason why iron workers would need to perform V-cuts and a 45 degree cut on this piece of structure just to remove it from the rubble? Another element suggesting the use of explosives is the complete disappearance of the hat trusses, the large steel structures that connected and bound the towers from above. The hat trusses covered an area of one acre in size and sat on the very top of each building. There was nothing above that could have crushed them except for the antenna on the north tower, which in fact was supported by the hat truss. If a simple gravitational collapse had occurred, one would expect to find the hat trusses sitting on top of the rubble, partially deformed maybe, but still recognizable. Instead, both steel structures, each one acre in size, seem to have vanished into thin air. From the hundreds of pictures taken at ground zero, including the aerial shots, no recognizable section of the hat trusses seems to be visible. Curiously, the antenna from the north tower was found, deformed but still recognizable. But the hat trusses which bound the towers together and supported the antenna seem to have vanished completely. Possibly the most important unexplained phenomenon at ground zero are the extremely high temperatures registered under the rubble for many weeks after the collapses. On September 16, NASA shot these thermographic images of ground zero indicating unusually high temperatures at the base of the three collapsed buildings. Despite the heavy rains of September 14th, the hotspots registered peak temperatures of more than 1300 degrees under the rubble. 10 days later, the fires kept burning. What's to explain, Governor, the smoke that still comes out There's of the still, fire? There's still fire down below. There is such an incredibly deep pile of rubble and the, the tower goes down five, six stories underground. But we had uh, ABC uh, crews come back just in the last few minutes and telling us there are still flames coming out of the base of the trade towers. For the rescue workers, this became an additional burden on their already gruesome task. Out still on the rubble, it's still, uh, I believe, 1,100 degrees. The guy's boots just melt within a few hours. On October 8th, the hot spots under the three collapsed buildings remained clearly visible. Six weeks later, as the excavations progressed, the situation seemed only to get worse. Oh, it's unbelievable. And this is six weeks later, almost six weeks later. And as we get closer to the center of this, it gets hotter and hotter. It's probably 1,500 degrees. We've had some small windows into um, what we thought was a core at some point, and it looked like a, uh, an oven, you know? It was just roaring inside. And it's just a bright, bright reddish-orange color. The consequences of such extreme temperatures were quite visible on the steel that was being extracted from the rubble. Where the grapplers were, were pulling stuff out, uh, big sections of iron that were literally on fire on the other end. They would hit the air and burst into flames, which was uh, pretty spooky to see. You would create an air pocket by moving steel, fueling the fires underground. But you know, these underground fires were just uh, like the fires of hell. If you could make a video of what you perceive hell to look like from fire shooting up at times, that's what would happen. You would be in the middle of what would look like steel, and then fire just would pop up. The firemen were coming out, with, and iron workers with their boots literally melted. And then the hose would come over, and they would try to put that part out. I got there. Charlie Vitchers was a supervisor of removal operations at Ground Zero. From PBS's America Rebuilds page, we read, Vitcher's crew picked up 40 to 60 foot long pieces of steel impaled in the pile, where the bottom 20 feet would be glowing red hot. Vitcher said, trucks loaded with steel would pass by and you could feel the back of your neck burning standing 20 feet away. In an article called A Dangerous Work Site, the U.S. Department of Labor wrote, underground fires burned at temperatures of 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. This was confirmed by Mayor Giuliani. There were fires of 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit below the ground. The Journal of the American Society of Safety Engineers wrote, thermal measurements taken by helicopter each day showed underground temperatures ranging from 400 to more than 2,800 degrees Fahrenheit. Eight weeks later, and the fires still had not subsided. You see how this debris is still smoking? That's when the fire is gonna still burn it. Eight weeks later, we still got fires burning. So, I mean, these things are burning. At one point, I think they were about 2,800 degrees. 11 weeks later, and the fires kept burning. 
as recently as the end of November, it was still 1,100 degrees down underneath the rubble. As November turned into December, ice was noticed in the mornings above the ground, but the debris underneath was still smoldering. The weird thing was it was very cold. When we were up there, I believe it was, it was in the middle of the winter, but the ground wasn't frozen. The ground kind of like bubbled underneath your feet, which was kind of strange to me. It took until December 19, more than three months after the collapses, for the last underground fire to be extinguished. The debunkers have suggested different possibilities for this unexplained phenomenon. For example, it could be the fact that inside the soil, there are the soil, there is a parking lot with automobiles. In the soil, there are the generators of the soil. Neither of these, however, seems to be a valid answer. In regards to the gasoline, the American Society of Safety Engineers wrote, three underground floors had been used as a parking garage with a total capacity of 2,000 cars. The cars were eventually located and removed. Some had exploded and were completely burned out, while others were in pristine, drivable condition. The gasoline in a car either explodes or it remains inside the tank. It does not leak out and go looking for fires to be fueled. In regards to the generator tank, the Society of Safety Engineers wrote, 72,000 gallons of diesel fuel were stored in a tank on basement level seven. The tank was eventually located and inspected. Although slightly damaged, no leaks were found. The fuel was removed. Another proof of extremely high temperatures reached during the collapses are the twisted and mangled steel beams found at ground zero. Architects, engineers, people who work with steel, welders have just never seen the level of destruction and the level of deformation of this material in our lives. You saw it steel, some of the thickest steel I've ever seen bent like a pretzel. This eight ton steel I-beam is six inches thick it was selected to be preserved for future generations for the near-perfect horseshoe-like bend formed during the collapse. I found it hard to believe that it actually bent because of the size of it and how there's no cracks in the iron. It bent without almost a single crack in it. It takes thousands of degrees to bend steel like this. In fact, the temperature of 2,800 degrees mentioned before is not casual at all, as that's exactly the temperature at which steel melts and molten steel was repeatedly found under the rubble at ground zero. You'd get down below and you'd see molten steel, like a molten line. steel running down the channel rails, like you're in a foundry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like lava. Like, like, it was like lava, lava from a volcano. The fires got very intense down there and actually melted beams where it was molten steel that was being dug out. Just like they did for the explosions, the debunkers simply doubt the testimonies on molten steel as a whole. NIST has also denied any knowledge of molten steel at ground zero. I'm curious about uh, the uh, pool of molten steel that was found in the bottom of the, of the tower. Uh, uh, I know of absolutely nobody, no eyewitness who said so, nobody who's produced it. Uh, I was on the site, I was on the steel yards, so I can't, I don't know that that's so. It is true, Mr. Gross did visit the steel yards where the remnants of the towers had been collected. But he must have been in a big hurry, as he didn't even notice the high degree of deformation of massive steel beams sitting only a few feet away. In any case, there are several highly credible witnesses who have reported the presence of molten steel at Ground Zero. Rich Garlock, a structural engineer working at Ground Zero, said, Going below, it was smoky and really hot. Here, World Trade Center 6 is over my head. The debris past the columns was red hot, molten, running. A supervisor from the National Environmental Health Association, Ron Berger, stated, feeling the heat, seeing the molten steel, the layers upon layers of ash, like lava, it reminded me of Mount St. Helens. William Langevisha is the author of American Ground, a book containing detailed descriptions of the conditions at ground zero. One passage mentions streams of molten metal that leaked from the hot cores and flowed down broken walls inside the foundation hole. Greg Fushek, who provided the rescue workers with global positioning equipment, stated, sometimes when a worker would pull a steel beam from the wreckage, the end of the beam would be dripping molten steel. Peter Tully of Tully Construction said that he saw pools of literally molten steel at the World Trade Center. 
Mark Loiseau, president of Control Demolitions, Inc., was told by contractors at Ground Zero about hot spots of molten steel in the basements at the bottoms of the elevator shafts of the main towers. Dr. Abalasan Astane, a professor of civil engineering at Berkeley University, examined the remains of the Twin Towers. He said, I saw melting of girders at World Trade Center. If you remember the Salvador Dali paintings with the clocks that are kind of melted, it's kind of like that. That could only happen if you get steel yellow hot or white hot, perhaps around 2000 degrees. Possibly the most authoritative account of all comes from Leslie Robertson, the engineer who had built the Twin Towers. We were down, uh, down at the B1 level and one of the firefighters uh, said, I think you'd be interested in this and, and they pulled off a big block of concrete and there was a, like a little river of steel uh, flowing. Again, ignoring all these testimonies does not mean to have debunked the presence of molten steel below the rubble. It just means turning a blind eye to what the actual situation at Ground Zero was after the collapse of the Twin Towers. And there's more. Concrete normally doesn't melt in regular fires. In fact, one of the reasons it's used in civil construction is its resilience to high temperatures. Yet molten concrete was found at Ground Zero. Preserved at the New York Police Museum, this artifact caption reads, during recovery efforts, several handguns were found at Ground Zero, including these two cylindrical gun casing remains and a revolver embedded in concrete. Fire temperatures were so intense that concrete melted like lava around anything in its path. Some debunkers have argued that this cannot be molten concrete, as the higher melting point of concrete would have also melted the steel from the gun. But the molten concrete could have already been cooling off by the time it encountered the guns, in which case it would not have melted them instantly. Here, for example, is flowing lava from a volcano, which is in the process of cooling off after having reached the melting point. As one can see, the lava surrounds the base of the trees without necessarily incinerating them at once. In a hangar near Kennedy Airport sits another artifact attesting to the extreme temperatures reached during the collapses. This formation is really four separate stories of the World Trade Center, compressed, compacted, incinerated, exposed to temperatures as hot as the inner Earth. I never knew this existed. Another of these artifacts, nicknamed the meteorite, contains both molten steel and molten concrete. One of the more unusual artifacts to emerge from the rubble is this rock-like object that has come to be known as the meteorite. It's this fused element of, of steel, mo molten steel and concrete and all of these things all fused by the heat into one single element. As we know, for concrete to melt, a temperature of several thousand degrees is needed and the result will be much the same as the lava that comes out of volcanoes. And almost like a chunk of lava from Kilauea or Iceland where they're very sharp but, but breakable shards on the end here. Question. Given that most of the jet fuel was burned after the impacts, given that only office fires were burning at the time of the collapses, and given that no major source of combustibles seems to have been available underground, can you offer a comprehensive explanation for the temperatures up to 2800 degrees reported at ground zero, for the long-lasting fires underground, for the incandescent beams repeatedly extracted from the rubble, for the massive steel beams bent like a pretzel, for the molten steel and the molten concrete observed and found at ground zero as caused by the office fires and the gravitational collapses only? The last set of evidence against a gravitational collapse is the almost complete pulverization of all the contents of the Twin Towers beginning with the concrete floors. Had a simple gravitational collapse occurred, one would expect to find 110 floors pretty much stacked up on each other like it happens in regular collapses. In the case of the Twin Towers instead, practically all the concrete from the 110 floors of both buildings was literally pulverized. What happened to the concrete? The concrete was pulverized, and I was down here Tuesday, and it was like you were on a foreign planet. All of lower Manhattan, not just this site, from river to river, there was dust powder two, three inches thick. The concrete was just uh, pulverized. What do you think this is? I have no idea. Of but your guess is? Pulverized cement. Pulverized cement? The concrete. The concrete wasn't the only part of the buildings that was pulverized during the collapses. We're talking here about 43,600 windows, 600,000 square feet of glass, 
200,000 tons of structural steel, 5 million square feet of gypsum, 6 acres of marble, and 425,000 cubic yards of concrete, turned in good part into a cloud. And then there were the contents of 110 floors of office space from each tower. It's hard to picture literally thousands of computers, desks, chairs, telephones, printers, and other office furnishings, floor over floor over floor, all enclosed in one building. This was one of the trading rooms of the World Trade Center. Had the floors simply collapsed on each other, all these things would have later emerged from the rubble, definitely crushed and torn, but still recognizable. Almost none of that was found. There wasn't much that you could say you could describe. Everything was, uh, everything was dust and metal. There was, there was no typewriters, there was no chairs, there was no, there was no nothing. Everything had been crushed. Everything was pulverized. There was, you know, there were no desks, there were no phones, there were, you know, maybe now and then you find a fragment of something, but basically everything was just pulverized. There wasn't a, 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 a computer screen, a laptop, the, uh, there's no what was it? I mean, it, it was, you know, two 110-story buildings of office equipment. You don't find a chair. You don't find a telephone, a computer. The biggest piece of a telephone I found was half of the keypad, and it was about this big. It was devastation. There wasn't one thing that resembled an office building, and this was the biggest office building in the world. That I haven't seen a door, I haven't seen a phone, I haven't seen a computer, I haven't seen a doorknob. I think that stands out. Another thing that stands out is the complete absence of filing cabinets from the rubble. With two towers filled with offices from top to bottom, there should have been thousands of them, of every shape, size, and color. Only one was found, and it was definitely not in good condition. Perhaps the most astonishing object Shate found is something there should have been thousands of. This one probably only survived because it was in the basement. I'd pretty much given up trying to find some sort of intact file cabinet. But while I was at the compound for the Port Authority Police, this ball of metal about the size of a basketball was delivered to them. You can see what remains of the uh, file folders. The concrete floors, the furniture, the computers and the file cabinets weren't the only things missing after the collapses. The Twin Towers were also filled with people. Inexplicably, though, almost half of the victims' bodies seem to have disappeared into thin air. When a building collapses, the victims tend to remain trapped between the pancaking floors. They may be crushed and mangled, but in most cases they remain in one piece. In fact, on the morning of September 11, local hospitals prepared to receive hundreds of victims they expected to be extracted from the rubble. Practically no one arrived. According to the chief medical examiner, 2,749 victims died in the Twin Towers, but fewer than 300 whole bodies were recovered. Nearly 20,000 pieces of bodies were found in the ruins, more than 6,000 small enough to fit in 5-inch test tubes. 200 different pieces were matched to a single person. 1,630 victims were eventually identified, 800 of which by DNA alone. This means that for 800 victims, there were no body parts large enough to be recognizable. The remaining 1,119 victims were never identified. This means that for more than 40% of the victims, not even a fragment large enough to recover DNA was found. For Joyce and Russell Mercer, there is no trace of the son they lost on 9-11, firefighter Scott Kapitko. You can't go to a cemetery, can't put flowers down. Personally, I lost a cousin in the building and never found his re remains. He was on the 100th floor of Tower 1 and they never found his, uh, anything or any remnants. Patricia Riley recovered her sister Lorraine's handbag, but nothing of her body. Lorraine has a tombstone at the cemetery, but she isn't there. 1,100 victims completely unaccounted for. In other words, no pieces large enough to gain any DNA from. Vaporized. Can fire and a gravitational collapse account for this massive pulverization of people. This map by the New York Fire Department shows the locations around the towers where human remains were found. Yellow circles are body parts from civilians. Red triangles are from firefighters. 
The very distance at which some of the body parts were found remains inexplicable with a simple gravitational collapse. In fact, fragments of human remains continued to emerge from ground zero for many years after the attacks. Well, human remains were found at the World Trade Center site on Wednesday. Crews made the discovery at 11 Water Street. Another four possible remains were found at the Whole Road excavation site. The ME is also investigating other remains that were found about two weeks ago on the roof of 90 West Street. Construction workers found nine pieces of bone and tissue on a 20th floor scaffolding on this building on West Street. Workers have found 65 potential human remains at the World Trade Center site over the last couple of days. The medical examiner's office says they were recovered from the Liberty Street section of the site. Then in 2006 came the biggest surprise. Demolition workers found 74 new bone fragments on the roof of the Deutsche Bank building over the weekend. That's the most found since the end of major recovery operations at the site. The number of fragments found on the roof of the Deutsche Bank kept increasing by the day. Crews continue to find human bone fragments on the roof of the Deutsche Bank building next to the Trade Center site. The medical examiner's office says 142 fragments were found, bringing to 598 the total number of fragments found in the building. Eventually, more than 700 bone fragments were recovered from the Deutsche Bank building. USA Today wrote, the bone fragments are tiny, some the size of a pinky nail. Some debunkers have suggested that the bone fragments could have reached the roof of the Deutsche Bank after the impact of American 11, as some debris exited the opposite side of the tower in a southerly direction. But the view of the Deutsche Bank was blocked by the South Tower at the time of impact, and there was no direct line between the exit hole in the North Tower and the roof of the Deutsche Bank. Furthermore, as seen in this map, the body parts found on the roof belong not only to civilians, but also to firefighters, who were clearly not present in the North Tower at the time of impact. Question. Can you explain how a simple gravitational collapse, where the bodies remain trapped between pancaking floors, could have produced more than 20,000 body parts out of 2,700 victims, while more than 1,100 bodies left no fragments large enough to extract a DNA sample? Can you explain how a simple gravitational collapse could have produced the bone fragments and body parts from civilians and firefighters that were recovered from the roof of the Deutsche Bank building? At this point, we can summarize the evidence for a gravitational collapse and compare it with the one for controlled demolitions. The official explanation for the initial collapse, or sagging trusses theory, is fundamentally flawed for at least three reasons. There is no evidence that the fireproofing was widely dislodged from the steel trusses, no evidence for temperatures high enough to seriously weaken the steel, and no valid explanation on how the trusses could have pulled and broken the external structure on their own. At the same time, the initial collapse is fully compatible with a controlled demolition. The official explanation for the total collapse of the Twin Towers does not exist, nor was a scientific calculation ever attempted by NIST, as they have repeatedly acknowledged. At the same time, the full collapse of the buildings is fully compatible with a controlled demolition. The vertical acceleration of the upper sections to near free-fall speed makes it impossible to explain the collapses by gravitation only, without violating at least two fundamental laws of physics. At the same time, the near free-fall acceleration achieved by the collapsing towers is fully compatible with a controlled demolition. The amount of witnesses who reported powerful explosions and the ensuing devastation in the Twin Towers is overwhelming. Such explosions cannot be explained by jet fuel alone, while they are fully compatible with a controlled demolition. The squibs observed 30 and 40 floors below the level of collapse cannot be explained by the air pressure in a gravitational collapse. At the same time, squibs are the typical signature of controlled demolitions. Not all the diagonal cuts and V-cuts observed on the columns at ground zero can be explained by the removal operations. At the same time, these kind of cuts are another typical signature of controlled demolitions. The large area of debris around the towers, with the lateral ejection of elements weighing several tons, cannot be explained by a gravitational collapse. At the same time, these ejections are fully compatible with the use of powerful explosives. The long-lasting fires, the extreme temperatures under the rubble, the incandescent beams extracted during the cleanup, the high degree of deformation of massive steel beams, the molten steel and molten concrete observed and found at ground zero cannot be explained by jet fuel alone, nor by regular office fires. Highly effective destructive devices capable of developing extremely high temperatures must have been used as part of a controlled demolition. The almost complete pulverization of the contents of both towers, 
from the concrete floors to the office furnishings to the actual vaporization of victims' bodies cannot be explained by a simple gravitational collapse. At the same time, these results are fully compatible with the presence of powerful explosives, such as those used in controlled demolitions. Unless a comprehensive, scientifically sound explanation for all the phenomena observed is presented, the only conclusion available is that the Twin Towers were brought down by some form of controlled demolition. After they published their report on the Twin Towers, NIST moved on to tackle the collapse of Building 7. What they faced was no easy task. Contrary to the Twin Towers, Building 7 had not been hit by an airplane. It was only partially damaged by the collapse of the North Tower, and it suffered fires that were anything but devastating. Nothing could have suggested it was going to collapse. On the other hand, it looked like the perfect controlled demolition. It featured the sudden onset of the collapse, the rapid acceleration towards the ground, the symmetrical descent of the structure, and it even appeared to have started the collapse from the bottom, as most controlled demolitions do. Professionals in the field of controlled demolitions, such as Dutchman Danny Uenko, seem to have no doubt on what had happened. This is controlled demolition. Zeker weten. Zeker weten. Er is nagesprongen. Dit is een opdracht gebeurd. Het heeft een team gedaan van experts. We weten heel goed wat ze doen, die jongens. Zie je vanaf boven gaan? Nee, je gaat vanaf onder. Die gaat vanaf onder, ja. Toch? Ja. Ze hebben gewoon kolommen weggeblazen. Er is nagesprongen. Similar comments were made by TV anchors watching the replay of the collapse. It's reminiscent of those pictures we've all seen too much on television before when a building was deliberately destroyed by well-placed dynamite to knock it down. In spite of what seemed obvious to everyone, NIST came up with an absolute historical first. New York City, 2001. No tall building had ever collapsed primarily due to fire. But that's exactly what investigators believe happened to the 47-story World Trade Center Building 7 on September 11th. World Trade Center 7 collapsed because of fires. We really have a new kind of progressive collapse that we have discovered here, which is a fire-induced progressive collapse. According to NIST, the collapse was triggered by the failure of one specific column, number 79, located in the northeastern section of the building. So you look at the uh, floors failing here, and eventually this column 79 is going to buckle, it fails, and then the entire vertical progression takes place. NIST blamed thermal expansion as the phenomenon that caused the collapse, which was also an absolute first in history. Our study has identified thermal expansion as a new phenomenon that can cause the collapse of a structure. For the first time, we have shown that fire can induce a progressive collapse. Coming from such a reputable organization, these kinds of statements should have sent shockwaves through the architectural world. What they're telling us is that our existing building codes to which thousands of skyscrapers are currently designed, there's a serious problem. If NIST's findings were true, hundreds of skyscrapers from all over the world would suddenly be in danger of a collapse due to fire. This should have called for the immediate suspension of all high-rise constructions, widespread verifications in all existing skyscrapers, and a serious revision of fire codes and safety regulations for the new ones to be built. None of that has happened. Steel skyscrapers have continued to be built just as usual. The ones that caught fire, even when fully engulfed in flames, have continued to remain standing and not one of the basic tenets of fire protection has been modified when it comes to designing high-rise steel buildings. At the same time, it should be noted that NIST's report on Building 7 was never published by a peer-reviewed publication. This means their analysis of the collapse cannot be validated from a scientific point of view. Even though this was an unprecedented event in history, we are being asked by NIST to take their word for the soundness of their conclusions. It's based on sound science, and it is consistent with all the observations we have. But it has never happened before, right? But it's, it's, the physics is consistent, it's sound, it's been analyzed, and we have the results. And we, we are very comfortable with our findings. They might have been comfortable, but the scientific community of architects and engineers was not. Science is never secret when it's done right. Science isn't science unless it's published, unless it's openly published and made available for criticism. Architects and Engineers has asked NIST to at least verify the computer model on which they've based their theory of the collapse. 
but also in this case, NIST has refused to make their data public. Structural engineers rail against NIST because they refuse to show the visualization. It's a black box. You cannot download any of this data. This means that also for the accuracy of their computer model, we have to take NIST's word for it. Here is our structural model showing the building collapsing, which matches quite well with the video of the event. This is the video of the event. On the right is one of the two animations released by NIST on the collapse of Building 7. When you observe the footage of how the building failed and when you look at the, the, the animation of the failure and compare that to what you actually observe in reality, I think they, they disprove their own theories. It is impossible for it, for it to fail the way they said. The second animation released by NIST is even more inconsistent with the real event. While the animation shows a pronounced inward bending of the top of the structure, the video footage shows the entire top section of the building maintaining its shape all the way through the visible part of the collapse. This can be verified by different angles. If this is what NIST calls matching quite well, one can imagine what the reliability of their entire report can be. A similar problem is presented by the computer model NIST has used to simulate the progression of the fires in the building. This computer model was developed by NIST, and no one has been allowed to verify it. Again, we are being asked by NIST to trust them on its validity. We use a well-validated computer program developed at NIST for studying the growth and spread of fires to calculate temperatures throughout the building. On the right in this slide, for example, you see a detailed fire simulation showing the temperature of fires as they grew and spread on floor 12. The graphic shows the temperatures in floor 12 rising after 1 p.m. and peaking around 4 p.m. on the northeastern side of the building. But the same picture NIST has published in their report, which was taken between 3.49 and 3.54 p.m., shows that the fires have already died off across the entire eastern section of the 12th floor. A similar picture, taken between 3.53 and 4.02 p.m., confirms that the fires on the eastern side of the 12th floor had already died off. NIST itself has stated in the same page that there is no indication of fires burning on the east side of the 12th floor at this time. In other words, the accuracy of NIST's computer model doesn't even need to be verified, as it's disproven by the very pictures and statements NIST has published in their own report. In order to justify the first and only collapse in the history of a steel skyscraper due to fire, the debunkers have maintained that Building 7 was weaker than the average steel structure because it had been built over an existing electrical substation. Alors, une des particularités de cette tour 7, c'est que elle a été bâtie sur un bâtiment existant qui est une sous-station électrique qui avait été construite dans les années 60, alors que la tour 7 a été bâtie dans les années 80. On verra que ça a été une des raisons de De la ruine de cette, de ce bâtiment. The building was extremely unconventional. It had this giant uh, con ed substation with enormous trusses carrying extraordinarily high loads, very vulnerable to fire and uh, other kinds of damage. But NIST itself has refuted this possibility. From the final report, we read The transfer elements such as trusses, girders, and cantilever overhangs that were used to support the office building over the Con Edison substation did not play a significant role in the collapse of World Trade Center 7. In fact, it was the opposite. After it was completed, Larry Silverstein had the building reinforced beyond its requirements in order to accommodate the needs of its main tenant, Solomon Brothers. From this 1989 New York Times article, we read, Solomon Brothers intends to spend nearly two years and more than $200 million cutting out floors, adding elevators, reinforcing steel girders, upgrading power supplies, and making other improvements in its million square feet of space. We built in enough redundancy to allow entire portions of floors to be removed without affecting the building's structural integrity, said Larry Silverstein, president of the company. More than 375 tons of steel, requiring 12 miles of welding, will be installed to reinforce floors for Solomon's extra equipment. If there was one skyscraper in the world that should have never collapsed due to fire, it was Building 7. While NIST has been unable to come up with a valid explanation for a collapse due to fire, there are at least three good reasons why such a collapse could not have happened in any case. One is the widespread pre-knowledge of the event. As we have said before, the collapse of a steel structure due to fire is considered an absolute impossibility in the architectural world. Steel structural frame buildings, high-rise buildings, 
simply do not collapse due to fire. We've never had a steel framed skyscraper collapse in the United States or internationally. No high rise steel structure has ever been destroyed by a fire in the history of construction. Consequently, if Building 7 was truly brought down by fire, it would have been a totally unexpected event, which would have taken everyone by surprise. It turns out instead that dozens of policemen, firemen, and first responders had been warned that the building was going to come down as early as five hours before it happened. All I can attest to is that by noon or one o'clock, they told us we had to move from that triage site up to Pace University, a little further away, because Building 7 was going to come down or being brought down. Did they actually use the word brought down, and who was it that was telling you this? In the fire department, the fire department, and um, they did use the word, we're going to have to bring it down. Firemen also had been warned of the impending collapse. Fireman Holowack, we were just hanging out until Tower 7 came down. Fireman Sweeney, we stood and waited for World Trade Center 7 to come down. By 4 p.m., CNN had already picked up the rumor and was spreading it around the world. We are getting information now that one of the other buildings, Building 7 in the World Trade Center complex, is on fire and has either collapsed or is collapsing. At 5 o'clock, the BBC announced that the building had already collapsed, even though it was still standing in the background. Jane Stanley. Jane, what more can you tell us about the Salomon Brothers building and its collapse? As you can see behind me... At 5 o'clock, Building 7 can clearly be seen on the right of the picture. But the BBC correspondent, who was obviously unfamiliar with the landscape, didn't recognize it. This has fueled ludicrous conspiracy theories, which accuse the mainstream media of having been informed in advance of what was going to happen on September 11. In truth, this incident only confirms that the information on the impending collapse had been circulating long enough in downtown Manhattan to have already reached the BBC, even before it happened. At about the same time, when CNN recorded the explosions near Building 7, they also captured the police clearing the area and announcing the collapse. This is the account by a paramedic who witnessed the collapse. You know, we heard this, this sound that sounded like a clap of thunder. Turned around, we were shocked to see that the building was, uh, uh, well, it looked like there was um, a shock wave uh, ripping through the building and the windows all uh, busted out. And, you know, it was, it was horrifying. And then, uh, you know, about a second later, the bottom floor caves out. And uh, the building followed after that, and um, we saw the building crash down all the way to the ground. There's even someone who heard a countdown moments before the building collapsed. First responder Kevin McPadden was stationed near Building 7, awaiting for orders from a Red Cross representative. You know, he kept asking the, the Red Cross rep, what's going on, what's going on? And all the time he had his hand over the radio while he was getting a countdown. And then he's just like, at the last three seconds, he takes his hand off and you hear three, two, one, and, and he had this like heartbroken face. He's just like, just run for your life. It was about a second or two after the, the countdown ended that you started hearing the explosions. Explosions. Now, we're talking about bombs. Because, you know, you get that like, ba bam you know, there's like a little explosion and then the force. And then boom, 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 boom. That was the building coming down. Question. Given that the collapse of a steel skyscraper due to fire would have been an unprecedented event, how could so many people have known about it so many hours in advance? If the police clearing the area expected a structural failure due to fire, why would they use such an expression as, the building is about to blow up? Can you explain how an unprecedented, totally unexpected collapse due to fire could be predicted with absolute precision by an actual countdown? The second reason that makes the official explanation by NIST untenable is the symmetry of the collapse. As we have seen before, the entire top section of the building falls as a single piece, maintaining an almost perfect symmetry as it descends towards the ground. The symmetry is the smoking gun. It cannot happen that when you have asymmetric damage, you will get a perfectly symmetrical collapse. And all you need to do is look at the videos and see that. The exterior columns on the outside, as well as on the inside, at the bottom would have to be severed almost at the same time. 
in order for the perimeter to fall perfectly and symmetrically, which it pretty much does at building seven, all of those columns have to be removed within a ten tenth of a second of each other. Question. Can you explain how the almost simultaneous removal of all the columns, which was necessary for Building 7 to collapse in the way it did, can be caused by fire alone? The last and possibly most conclusive piece of evidence against the official explanation is freefall. After the initial failure of the penthouse on the eastern side of the building, the entire structure came crashing down to the ground in a little more than six seconds. David Chandler of Architects and Engineers has measured the downwards acceleration of the building from the start of the global collapse. You can measure the acceleration of Building 7 by video analysis. The slope of the velocity graph gives the acceleration. Note that global collapse starts suddenly and for the next 2.5 seconds the building accelerates at the rate of 9.88 meters per second squared. In other words, the rate of collapse of World Trade Center Building 7 over the first 2.5 seconds is literally indistinguishable from free fall in a vacuum. When architects and engineers presented NIST with these calculations, they forced them to correct their preliminary report and acknowledge the free fall of the building for the first eight stories of the collapse. From NIST's final report we read, a more detailed analysis of the descent of the north face found three stages. The first was a slow descent with acceleration less than that of gravity that corresponded to the buckling of the exterior columns at the lower floors. The second stage was a free fall descent over approximately eight stories at gravitational acceleration for approximately 2.25 seconds. 2.25 seconds is more than one third of the global collapse. Once NIST had admitted the free fall for one third of the collapse, the outcome of the debate was sealed. Building 7, uh, the NIST reports admits, fell at the rate of gravity for the first 100 feet. Well, that's impossible unless there's nothing resisting it. NIST has always acknowledged this. Free fall time would be an object that has no uh, structural components below it. And, as we have seen before, the almost simultaneous removal of the supporting structure can only be obtained with a controlled demolition. The building didn't disappear so the building can fall for 100 feet at free fall speed. That's impossible. That evidence alone would indicate that the official story doesn't hold water. Question. Can you explain how free fall, which requires the almost simultaneous removal of the supporting structure, can be achieved without a controlled demolition? This very question was posed to Senator John McCain by a 9-11 researcher in April 2013 during a C-SPAN broadcast. Uh, Senator McCain, the National Institute of Standards and Technology asserts that the collapse of Building 7 was caused by fire, yet they acknowledge that the first 100 feet of that collapse took place at free fall acceleration. Now, engineers will tell you that fire cannot do this and that the only method by which it can be accomplished is the use of pre-planted explosives. Your question is what? Well, I yeah, how do you explain this discrepancy of 100 feet of free fall without the use of explosives? Uh, to tell you the truth, this is an area that I am not very familiar, and if you would drop me a note and mention that we talked on C-SPAN, I'd be glad to get you a, uh, a more complete answer, but I... It is unfortunate that Senator McCain could not answer, as he is the person who wrote the foreword to the popular mechanics book, Debunking 9-11 Myths. In the foreword, McCain stated, any explanation for 9-11 must start and end with the facts. The evidence must be gathered and analyzed. Then, only then, can conclusions be drawn. But now that the evidence has been gathered and conclusions can be drawn, he claims ignorance on the whole matter. This brings us to the last question, which is not only for the debunkers, but for anyone who cares about freedom, democracy, and an honest government. If you were aware of solid evidence disproving the official version and suggesting the involvement of some rogue elements of the government in the terrorist attacks, would it be more unpatriotic and anti-American to ask for a new investigation or to turn a blind eye to it and pretend such evidence doesn't exist? Given that the people's trust in institutions is of paramount importance for a nation's well-being, would that trust be better served by denying the evidence of a conspiracy or by bringing those suspected to accountability in a court of law? 
We leave the last word to the first responders, who have been dying by the dozens after having inhaled the poisonous air from Ground Zero in the total silence of the media. I want to tell you tonight about the people we call heroes and are still in growing numbers living in terrible physical and economic circumstances as they struggle with the carcinogenic effects of the toxic chemical soup Ground Zero became. Can this side of the room, everybody stand up? Everybody on this side, if you're all rescue workers, will be dead in four years. Thank you. You'd all be dead in four years. That's our statistics. That's what's happening. In seven years, it doubles. And every time popular mechanics calls the people of this movement nuts, these propagandists, professional liars and tools who cannot even by any stretch of the imagination be considered journalists, strike another nail into the coffin of another rescue worker. I don't think we're crazy. Conspiracies are only evidence the courts won't hear. We who are still dying from 9-11, who went into the towers and into that pile, now live with those buildings in our lungs and digestive systems and our blood. For myself and far too many of us, research and the effective treatment is going to arrive far too late. I have double metastasizations in both lungs. That's just a reality. We were also killed on 9-11. Avenge us.